patronage principalities of the old Yemen state, basically towards, the, towards its end, it wasn't particularly significant. Uh, but uh, under Mongol rule, basically the, uh, the, the Muscovite princes became uh, the tax or tribute collectors for a very large territory in the, in the east. And it's through that position that they, they grew in, in power and influence. And so they began pounding at this Lithuanian border uh, in an attempt to uh, uh, basically reestablish uh, what they began to refer to as their patrimony, uh, patrimony of these, these, these early Kievan princes uh, in what is now uh, present-day Ukraine and, uh, and Belarus. So as Muscovy began pounding at that border, uh, the, uh, the Lithuanians, uh, who, uh, who had actually entered into a dynastic union with Poland uh, back in the 15th century, uh, the Lithuanians would eventually agree to a constitutional union with Poland. And, uh, and part of the reason for this was basically because it, it was having problems defending its, its, its eastern, eastern border. Uh, so with this constitutional union that was established in the, in the 16th century, uh, Poland, uh, and you'll note that Poland is, is, is a main player in the current uh, war in Ukraine, also for historical and geopolitical uh, reasons. But back in the 16th century, after this uh, uh, establishment of this constitutional union, Poland brought with it uh, uh, basically uh, serfdom, a uh, manorial system based on, uh, on serfdom. Uh, basically, the uh, effacement of the, of the orthodox uh, uh, nobility there, uh, that is U Ukrainian or you know, Saudi Slavic uh, nobility, uh, and, uh, and also Catholicism, and the creation of a kind of hybrid church, uh, especially in the western part of the, the Ukraine, uh, that was we know as a Greek Catholic church. Um, now, uh, basically, it's also during this period that uh, Ukraine established, you know, the, the, the use of the word Ukraine, Ukraine came into being, Ukraina, uh, which uh, is derived from Polish and basically means frontier or borderland. Mm -hmm. And so you, for, for, for Poland, Ukraine uh, was the borderland of its, uh, of, of this, uh, Polish Lithuanian constitutional uh, commonwealth. Um, okay, so, uh, but Muscovy, uh, now becoming the Russian Empire around the uh, 16, uh, or maybe we can go back one very quickly. Uh, uh, I just want to say that the reason that the Russians are going to be able to enter here is, is because of the rebellion. In, in 1648, because of some of the reasons uh, uh, that I mentioned, the, the sort of the, 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 the rival of serfdom, uh, the, the kind of post-colonization to Catholicism and, um, and sort of the effacement of the, the, the Orthodox nobility, uh, and, uh, and, you know, sort of the, la the, the desire for some kind of autonomy uh, within this region among uh, you know, the, uh, the local elites. So this would actually lead to a rebellion. This rebellion was successful for its, for, 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 uh, in, in its early years, but eventually began to fail. And as it failed, Bogdan Nolnitsky, who was the leader of this rebellion, basically turned to, the, turned to Muscovy, turned to the Russians uh, for protection for protection and support in this conflict. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, basically Ukrainian, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they basically traded uh, uh, one devil for the other, uh, as it were. And, the, and, the, and they got the, the, the worst devil in, in the Russians. Um, so Russia, Russia began, you can see already here uh, in the eastern part, to be, begin to, to, to seize some, some of these formerly Polish territories. And they would continue to do so in, in the partitions of Poland. 
So, uh, so basically, you can see here that a good part of Ukraine. Uh, so earlier we were talking about uh, the, the East Bank of Ukraine being lost to the Russians in around 1667. Now we're going to see West, you know, the West Bank of the Dnieper River, west of Kiev, also going to the Russians in these partitions of, uh, of Poland. Uh, leaving, though, a part of, uh, of Western Ukraine under Austro-Hungarian rule. And, and that part, let's go to that slide, um, that part is, uh, you can see, is called Galicia. You can see Poles in the west and Ukrainians in the east. This is this northeastern uh, crown land of, the, uh, uh, of Austria. Uh, uh, it was here, basically, where Ukrainian national identity uh, uh, developed. Uh, uh, not so much in the Russian part, but, but more here. Uh, so, so basically, you could say that Ukraine was partitioned between west and east. Uh, in the West, there, uh, the Ukrainians had more opportunity to develop a, a, a national uh, culture and identity. Uh, that would collide with the Poles, however, with whom they, uh, they shared this crown land, and the Poles uh, continued to actually rule over the crown land, even though uh, the Ukrainians um, uh, were demanding uh, first, uh, some uh, autonomy for their own national and cultural development, but eventually that would be transformed to demands for political autonomy. And uh, that would, uh, that would uh, so we have here 1910, and uh, let me just say that the Galicia during the First World War turned out to be a major battleground uh, between the West, as it were, that is Austria-Hungary in this case, uh, eventually joined by the Germans and uh, and uh, the Russians. Uh, this became a major battleground. Uh, it uh, territories were uh, invaded back and forth, and uh, uh, but eventually uh, all of this uh, Galicia was liberated by the forces of the Central Powers from Russian occupation and. Then the war was extended uh, into all of Ukraine, uh, and, and eventually, by the end of the night, by the time we get to uh, oh, I don't know the the time of the German uh, surrender, in November of 1918, on the Western Front, uh, basically uh, Germany was in control, or the Central Powers were in control of, uh, of all of the, all of Ukraine. They would eventually give that up, of course. Uh, but that would let their, eventually let their appetite for more because of the, the, the resources, and particularly the grain uh, uh, that uh, was produced in Ukraine. Okay, next one. Now, in, during the interwar period, uh, uh, again we see almost a, 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 a partition of Poland, this time between uh, the successor state of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire or one of them, that is the, the Second Polish Republic, which basically took over you know, the western part of Ukraine, including Lviv, uh, and then uh, the Russians, uh, and then the Russians uh, uh, further further to the east. So again, I, you know, I, I guess what I want to emphasize is one of, one of the ways to think about Ukraine is as a borderland, but also as kind of a battleground a battleground between these Western influences, sometimes Polish, sometimes, you know, as we saw, Austro-Hungarian Austro and German, and, 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 and Russia. Uh, and in fact, for a good part of its history, um, uh, Ukraine was uh, 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 basically partitioned uh, between a Western part uh, and an Eastern part. And, of course, it's going to be partitioned yet again. Um, but something called the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, uh, the Nazi-Soviet Pact of 19, 1939. And you can see that in the course of that, uh, uh, carrying out those actual territorial changes uh, resulting from the, the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact in 1939, that basically all of Ukraine uh, came under uh, 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 Soviet, uh, Soviet rule. So, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and a good deal of Belarus 
Belarus too. Uh, okay, so uh, so uh, as we know that uh, Nazi Soviet pact was broken in, in in the summer of 1941. This Germany launched its invasion of uh, the Soviet Union. And uh, again, you see uh, German power in Ukraine. This time it's the Reich's commissary of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and in fact, uh, this was maybe probably the major object of, uh, of Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. Uh, again, thinking back to the period of the First World War, when, uh, uh, when Germany and Austria-Hungary, both who were suffering from major food shortages, Looked uh, looked to Ukraine as as uh, a salvation uh, for, to uh, uh, in terms of grain. Uh, uh, you know, they looked at it as a, a potential uh, uh, breadbasket uh, for uh, for both of the central powers to to relieve them of uh, especially uh, food food shortages. Okay. Now the, the Soviets, of course, expelled the Germans, all right, and um, and here we see uh, Ukrainian territory now this time basically under Soviet rule, uh, uh, you know, again kind of partitioned, and you know there there are these additions and there are these deletions of Ukrainian territory. The major addition that occurred in 19, 1954, though. Uh, was Crimea. Uh, Crimea was added. Uh, and now, Crimea was, is, and, and probably forever will be a Russian majority speaking area. And, uh, and, uh, but the attachment of Crimea to, to, to Ukraine uh, was basically a, a, a move within the inner party communist circles by Nikita Khrushchev to, to his power base was in Ukraine. And so uh, to have, the, have Crimea as part of Ukraine uh, served his own personal political interests uh, quite well, even if, even if you know, ethno, ethnographically it made, it made no sense. Okay, so we're going to go fast forward into the present. You know, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union eventually collapses, and um, uh, Ukraine declares its independence, uh, and uh, uh, that independence is, you know, grudgingly recognized by the Russian Federation. Uh, there are uh, there are certain. Uh, uh, agreements that are reached around 2004 uh, and before regarding uh, Ukraine's nuclear disarmament and the uh, and basically the division of the Black Sea Fleet, uh, but with Crimea remaining uh, a part of part of uh, part of Ukraine. Uh, it was interesting though, this, throughout this period though, when Ukraine when Crimea remained part of part of Ukraine. Nonetheless, Russian naval use Russian, you know, that those facilities, those naval facilities in Crimea were used by both sides. Um, so you'd still see Russian Russian ships and Russian warships, you know, sort of anchored off uh, off of the, the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, so, uh, so here we come again to the the most current current East West uh, conflict over Ukraine. Uh, as, uh, you know, in post-independence Ukraine, there were a series of pro-Russian, uh, pro-Russian uh, 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 presidents. Uh, sometimes popularly elected, sometimes fraudulently elected. And um, in 2014, uh, as it appeared that the majority of Ukrainians wanted to make a move towards joining the European Union, and the pro-Russian president, who had earlier been in favor switched sides, uh, probably under the pressure of, uh, of Putin, and uh, under the pressure of Putin, uh, and uh, this would lead to uh, protests and eventually lead to a rebellion, 
uh, against a, uh, I, there were new elections that were, again, fraudulently uh, 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 carried out. And, uh, and eventually we know that, uh, you know, that while uh, the pro-Russian government was thrown out, nonetheless, Russia itself would take, you know, would invade Crimea and then uh, also uh, 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 engineer the separation of two Russian-speaking quote-unquote republics in the East, Luhansk and, and Donetsk. And there we have it. Um, so, uh, and this has basically led to a, a almost permanent state of war in this region because the, the, uh, these separatist claimed areas are really Russian claimed areas. Uh, that is, uh, this is the area where now uh, uh, Putin seems to be concentrating uh, Russian forces. Basically, this is what is the, the Donbass. And uh, you can see that in the 1914 uh, uh, military operation, as it were, uh, but not so, not so well disguised, that, uh, you know, basically uh, the, uh, these two separatist uh, republics only comprise uh, less than half of the Donbass, uh, the Don Basin. Uh, which is basically a, 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 an energy rich basin, uh, coal in particular. Um, but also very Russian speaking. Now, what's interesting about this conflict is that you see here Mariupol, uh, you know, they never got to Mariupol then. Uh, and in these other areas, this Russian speaking population is by and large loyal to Ukraine maybe sympathetic to Russia at, some, at a certain level, uh, perhaps because they felt that they had been uh, uh, somewhat discriminated against uh, in terms of use of, uh, use of the, the Russian language as a public, you know, as, a, as the state language, Ukrainian was a state language. Uh, but uh, what I want to emphasize is that that where we're seeing most of the 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 uh, the uh, destruction is really in in, in Russian speaking Ukraine. Uh, the Russian Russian forces are, are are really assaulting Russian civilians in this this eastern part of Ukraine. And if anything, uh, this uh, this action against these civilians in eastern eastern Ukraine is more. More, even more cemented their loyalty to the Ukrainian state. And so, here we come. Uh, this is as of the 28th when I was putting together these slides. The uh, situation has changed a bit uh, on the ground. Uh, as I understand, even, you know, even more uh, territory has been taken by Ukraine to the north and east of, uh, of Kiev just overnight. Um, uh, it's not, you know, what's going on here is very unclear. Russia speaks of a pullback. Uh, uh, um, I, I'm, I, to, and also, but also regrouping uh, to uh, uh, concentrate its forces in the, in, in the east. Uh, they still have yet to take Mariupol. Uh, they, uh, they still have yet to take Kharkiv. And these are, let me just again uh, emphasize that these are majority Russian speaking areas. The, uh, some, around 90%, around 90% are Russian speaking Ukrainians. So I think if it, these were, maybe these were the, 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 the part of the population that Putin expected that would treat uh, the invading Russian forces as liberators, it hasn't happened. In fact, the exact the exact uh, opposite. Um, and um, so, Russian warfare 2022, uh, the siege of, uh, of Mariupol. Um, <coughs> I, we haven't seen this kind of devastation since the, the, the Second World War. Uh, uh, even though in you know, Warsaw here, the, all, the, the destruction was uh, was uh, Nazi German, but 
But a lot of the fighting that took place there is very similar to the fighting that's currently taking place uh, in, in, in Mariupol, uh, street by street. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, but I, I don't want to say that you know, we see that image. I don't want to say that image should define the fighting. Uh, we can go to this next image, which I, uh, you know, may may define the fight. May may have defined the fighting if it, if it had come to to Kiev. Uh, I I don't think it will. But this could define the fighting in a place like Kharkiv. Uh, what I want to say though is that the, the Ukrainian army's performance, uh, not obviously not with. Uh, Molotov cocktails, but with uh, with stingers and javelins, and far more technically uh, technologically advanced drones uh, are, are are more have more than uh, uh, produced a stalemate uh, uh, in in uh, both well certainly in the north where it seems the Russians. You know, are, you know, or maybe trying to disguise a retreat as something else, uh, but uh, but I think it's also made a difference difference in the in the east, and uh, so perhaps uh, perhaps I will leave it at, at that, and um, and maybe we'll just now have a conversation. I probably went on longer than I intended to, so I so I apologize. Okay, can you hear us? I sure can. Anybody got questions? Sarah, how, how much should the Americans help? Well, uh, the Americans are helping quite a bit the way it is. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the reports that I've, I've seen coming out of uh, the this uh, Air Force base in Jesuf in, in southeastern Poland, where uh, a lot of the arms that are being uh, channeled into Ukraine, they are basically being unloaded there and uh, getting into Ukraine by various other means. Uh, uh, but from what I understand, that those shipments are around the clock and they're enormous. Um, uh, there's been the talk about the you know the transfer of these uh, 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 these uh, mothball Polish MiG fighters. Uh, to uh, to Ukraine, but they're they're so few in number. Uh, they might, you know, their significance would be more symbolic than anything. I I, I don't believe they would have any much impact on on the fighting. What the, what the Ukrainians would do need is more advanced anti missile, uh, more anti missile uh, uh, systems. Um, but I, from what I understand, those are coming. I also understand that these, these, uh, that uh, you know, six uh, naval uh, electronic warfare aircraft have been uh, are in Ramstein, and uh, you know, they uh, uh, that they have actually probably had an effect on the success of uh, uh, Russian missile launches. Uh, by jamming their jamming their uh, their systems, so um, yeah, I'm not sure that there's much more that the United States could do except get involved in the war itself. But there are some who would suggest where we already are. Why now, though? Why was it? Why was this attack made now? Having been put on that. Why was I'm sorry I didn't catch that question. Why was yeah, I was just asking, why did this happen now? What is the, why, why did Putin pick now to do all this? Do you have any idea? Because, because, the re okay, there's a couple of realities. One, I think the reality was the Ukraine's desire to join NATO. Um, and it was, uh, which was supported by an overwhelming majority probably about 77% of the population, uh, and the European Union. Uh, now, we, but the other thing is, is that since 2014, since the, 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 uh, the ouster of that pro-Russian regime that was in Kiev, uh, since then, Ukraine has been a success story. Uh, 
uh, it, is, it has been successful in cleaning up corruption. It's been uh, successful in establishing a, a, a work, you know, working, fu- fu- functioning democracy. Uh, it had transferred power uh, uh, once, anyway, without, uh, without uh, violence without, and without fraud. Uh, I mean, this was something kind of unique. And, uh, and the problem for Putin isn't that Ukraine necessarily poses a military threat, even as a member of NATO. Uh, rather, it's the political threat that, uh, that, uh, that Ukraine imposes. That is a, 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 a functioning, democratic, market, liberal market economy uh, that is is successful. The I, when you sort of think about going back to the old Soviet Union and the invasions of you, you, uh, Hungary and Czechoslovakia, the Soviets weren't worried about their military uh, <laughs> about a military threat. They were worried about the political threat. What the what kind of model would this serve? Okay, so the. This is the same question with Ukraine. What kind of model would this serve? You have an autocratic government in, in the Kremlin, right? You have a successful democratic government about probably on the verge of joining the European Union uh, on the other, which uh, uh, you know, really poses a major political political threat to, the, to, to Putin's regime. Um, so uh, this is why I think now, I, uh, and that's why you know that's why it wasn't just enough to try to go after these eastern territories, but after Ukrainian sovereignty itself. What is your best source of information on what's happening today in Ukraine? Well, I have Ukrainian students uh, who have family members. Uh, um, who, who are? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, these are these are basically civilians, but who are sticking it out. Uh, the uh, so far, uh, I got involved because it try if, if it became necessary to find get find them a safe route uh, and, and uh, shelter in Poland, I, I was in a position to do that. Um, but also, there's a, a, a television station in Poland called TVN24, TVN24, and it is it's it is round the clock broadcasting on the Ukrainian war, and um, and it's you know been a very good source of information, uh, <clears throat> uh, and very very reliable. It's very independent. It's, uh, uh, you know, they, well, it will interview uh, uh, Ukrainian political figures, to be sure. Uh, it is uh, not a, a necessarily what I would call a Ukrainian propaganda outlet. Uh, uh, it's obviously favorable to the cause of Ukraine, but, uh, but it's very, very independent in its, in its, re- in its reporting. And uh, and they have uh, and they probably have more more correspondence in Ukraine than, than any other any other uh, uh, broadcast network. Else? Other questions? One more question about uh, you mentioned a lot of propaganda, perhaps that Putin's worried about with his politics inside country. How much of that is actually reality that uh, the Russians would be? trying to counteract whatever he's doing? And is there any thought of them being able to push him out of office? Or how is that going to work? Um, that's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, if he came into Ukraine because of Ukraine's political threat, I mean, you can just sort of see signs of Russian weakness all around. I mean, look at the morale. Look at morale of... Uh, of these conscripts that have been thrown into the fighting. Um, uh, look at the arrests uh, in the in the thousands of those who protested this war in Ukraine. I mean, here and there you see there's a, a 
the uh, I don't know if you were this, but uh, but two three days ago, some Russian journalists uh, interviewed Zelensky, and it was a very frank interview. Um, and uh, uh, the Moscow State Television refused to show it. Uh, the uh, I. I think that the longer this war goes on, the worse it is for Putin's regime. And, um, and an even weaker regime than that is uh, Lukashenko's, in, in Lukashenko's in Belarus. Do you remember the soundings that Belarus was going to get involved in this war and, and uh, send its army into Ukraine, etc., etc.? Well, first of all, it has a ragtag army. Secondly, Belarus itself was uh, had to, uh, you know, Lukashenko's regime in Belarus had to be saved just a year ago by by Putin. Um, that would be the kiss of death for his regime would be to 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 get into get deeply more deeply than he already is into this Ukrainian war. Um, so, uh, yeah, I I think. Uh, if anything is going to push Putin towards a negotiated settlement, it's it's the it would be the threat to his power in Moscow uh, that this the continuation of this war poses. Um, uh, but it, you know these these things take time. Anyone else? What do you think would stop Putin from continuing on? Um, military defeat. Military defeat. Uh, I, 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 uh, military defeat, and there's already. It's already you know, on the heart. I mean, I think that it's it's already happening. Mm -hmm. Um. And so now I, I think the detention is going to be focused and shift more to the to the east. Uh, you know, while maybe trying to keep the pressure on Kiev a bit, um, uh, if for no other reason to, to, to pin down some Ukrainian forces there. Uh, but um, if if those targets of Kharkiv and Mariupol. Uh, aren't secure, and, and then the thing is, is even if they get Mariupol, what did they get? A heel of uh, a heap of rubbish, right? A heap of stone that they themselves have destroyed, you know, destroyed to 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 a pulp. So, yeah, maybe they get control of the the entire uh, Sea of Azov and 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 a good chunk of the Black Sea, northern part of the Black Sea, uh, linking to Crimea. But, um, but I'm not sure what strategic value that would have with everything is, is you know, in such, it's so destroyed. I mean, what well, we're, uh, so, uh, so, but I, I would look more towards the, the, the Donbass. If, if Ukraine is successful in defending the, the rest of the Donbass, um, which I think it's fully capable of doing, um, then uh, then that I think will spell military defeat in uh, at least uh, uh, in anyone in, in any rational mind. We got one more. Okay. Uh, okay, sir. A uh, couple of. Kind of a two-part question. There's been a lot of talk about NATO and the other countries, perhaps like Finland joining NATO or obviously the Ukraine maybe, but uh, that and the media. So what can other countries like Germany, what role should they and how good is our media, either countries uh, here or there, on determining what's really going on? 
Well, I, I, I do think Finland, uh, Finland and Sweden are moving closer towards towards NATO. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about it, especially I mean, Finland obviously has good historic reasons uh, to do so, historical reasons and geopolitical reasons. Um, the uh, uh, but the Sweden's cooperation with NATO has also uh, uh, become uh, particularly visible uh, during the, during this war. So I think there's a distinct possibility that 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 they that, that they might apply, uh, apply for uh, for NATO membership. And, and what the question about Germany? Germany, and then also with the media. In all the countries, is the media really portraying accurately what's going on? Um, so let's start with the United States in terms of media. Um, from what I can tell, there's been, you know, at least in daytime Fox News broadcasting and CNN broadcasting, I don't see much of it, much of a difference. Um, I think uh, they've both done an uh, extremely good job uh, of covering uh, covering a war in Ukraine, uh, as has uh, you know national public national public radio um, is also a good source uh, uh, here. Uh, as far as as far as Europe is concerned, um, uh, the there's certainly a key difference between a country like Poland. Which is a you know has you know Poland has been Ukraine's main cheerleader for NATO membership and for EU membership, um, and uh, and I say Poland has this historical interest. It has this. Uh, it has the geopolitical interest uh, in Ukraine. Uh, there's a reason why Poland is, is sort of the supply base for arms going into Ukraine. It's all, there's also a reason why, Pol why Poland has been so open to Ukrainian refugees. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, a pro-Western Ukraine serves Poland's interests. There's no doubt about that. Uh, as for, you know, I... One might say that the, you know, if you look at it from that perspective, sort of that, that sort of East European perspective, and maybe even from an American perspective, uh, the, um, the attitudes of the French and German governments have left something to be desired. Uh, the French in particular, uh, uh, the uh, Macron's attempts to, to Oh, I don't know. I would call it necessarily curry favor with Putin, but then nonetheless try to 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 adopt the position of somebody able to to broker a deal. Uh, this is this is basically designed to enhance his own electoral prospects uh, uh, as a as a statesman, uh, and it'll come to nothing, as his earlier attempts before the war came to nothing. Uh, uh, the Germans depended on Russian natural gas, uh, and um, I, unfortunately, I think that's the main determinant of the, uh, of the, 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 the policy, particularly on policies, particularly on uh, on sanctions. Um, uh, NATO is not nearly as united as we'd like to think, or as Biden. As Biden said, in, 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 in Warsaw and elsewhere, um, uh, it may be more united than it's been for some time, but it's not more really united, united as we like to think. And again, I'll just say one other thing: is think about it from the Polish perspective, uh, or well, you know, they're looking at Ukraine and they're saying that you know that that um, NATO refuses at least to get officially involved in Ukraine, even though it, there's no question that you know, NATO is involved in Ukraine. Those arms are coming from NATO. Um, uh, but I mean, it makes the polls wonder if it really, truly, Art Article 5 would be invoked if, for example, uh, the Russians went after that Air Force base in Jeshua. 
was recently visited by Biden. Um, again, that's where uh, I think the uh, uh, United States also has a has a uh, has a, has a presence, uh, uh, an Air Force presence, right? So um, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, but I think that they, they they are they are concerned that they would be left out in in left in the lurch if that were to happen. Um, and there's there's good reason to believe that they might be. Um, I guess that's it, Bob. We don't seem to have any more questions. He can't hear me, probably. Oh. Oh, I can hear you. Yes. Oh, I can, hear you. can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, yes, I sure can. Oh, okay. Has, has, has Russian military strength been less potent than it could be? Or. We've been led to believe that Russia was this almighty uh, armed forces, and it's not seeming out like it is. We get Bob no. on it. I can't drive it. under our desks anymore. I, I can give you my view of that. <laughs> it definitely is not as good as they thought it was. Right. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, is that, you know, Russians, but a lot of it has to do with morale. Uh, you need to have a cause. What's the cause here? Um, the I mean Ukrainians have a cause, uh, which is their, their their independence and sovereignty and territorial integrity. It's quite clear uh, what their cause is. Um, you know, what is it for the Russians? What is it for that Russian the Russian conscripts who believe that they were, you know, told that they were going to uh, participate in a special military operation to liberate? Uh, liberate population from you know a a a, a, a so-called Nazi-led government, right? I mean the propaganda, you know, the reality and the propaganda are so far apart from each other that um, uh, that it's that it's incredible. Uh, but the Russians have always, if you look historically, the Russians have always felt fought well on defense. Uh, when they're attacked themselves, they fight well. When they when they are when they cross borders for basically uh, for imperial reasons, they fight less well. Uh, they didn't fight well in the Russo Japanese War. They didn't fight well in the first you know in the, in the First World War. Um, uh, they basically they quite well in the opening stages of the second. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it, Russia has this history of being the paper tiger, uh, but, uh, you know, if the war were brought to Russia, that would be a different matter. Um, but, um, you know, they, they basically have artillery and missiles. They can't, they can't, they don't control the skies. Right? They don't control the airspace. Um, even if they have more mix than the Ukrainians do, they still don't control the airspace. Um, uh, uh, the drones that are used by, I uh, spoke to an expert on uh, the use of drones in, in this war uh, just yesterday. And he was telling me that the, 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 uh, the uh, the Ukrainian drones are far more technologically advanced than the Russian ones. And um, so, uh, I mean, you know, even, even with the missiles, uh, you know, a lot of them are shut down. Some of them are, a lot of them are even failing to launch at all. And this is where, you know, maybe those, maybe uh, those uh, airplanes equipped for uh, electronic warfare uh, are, are having an impact. We, we just don't know. We just don't know if those are... That, it's, that's all speculation. But they can, I guess, jam those sy sy uh, systems from long range. Um, so... Maybe they can fly close to the border and, and do it. So, I think... Uh, I hope that answers your question. I, uh, 
uh, but uh, no, it's not. You know, I, what Putin expected is to put a large military force along uh, the border of northern, uh, northern Ukraine, cross the border. He expected the government in Kiev to cave in and crumble. He expected, uh, he expected uh, the Russian-speaking population to, to treat them as liberators. Um, and it's it's all that's gone wrong. Sorry, one question. Yeah. Uh, controversy about the no-fly zone over Ukraine. Is that something we should be interested in or not? Well, um, you know, in, in terms of what you mean by a no-fly no zone, Right. If we talk about the uh, uh, no-fly zone that was established during the Yugoslav Wars, uh, that kind of no-fly zone, um, uh, then uh, you know that's something that we would, uh, you know, maybe end up in aerial combat. Um, I'm not sure that's to our that's to our uh, um, interest. Uh, I'm not sure it's even necessary, but. Well, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, Russian aircraft are, uh, are, are wreaking devastation on Ukraine. It's artillery, long-range artillery, and missiles. And what Ukraine needs isn't so much planes, it needs missile defense. Um, because it's really the missiles that are doing most of the da damage to artillery as well. Uh, if the Ukrainians could... Uh, remember that convoy? It was kind of parked on the highway, <laughs> a long stretch of highway in the north of Kiev. Uh, you know, Ukrainian drones took those out like sitting ducks. I mean, that whole highway was littered with... Um, destroy the uh, armored personnel carriers and tanks. Um, so, um, um, so I, I think that you know basically what the Ukrainians need more than anything is is effective uh, defense against these missile attacks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. So I don't know how many people were watching this because we were streaming it also. Yeah. Yeah. How many left because of the technical difficulties? Uh, well, that, that worked all right, but... We're used to that. <laughs> oh, well, we're, we're not, I, I, was, I was going to make a joke that the, the, the Russians jammed our, uh, yeah. our code. They could have been. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they could have been. It's cyber. <laughs> Cyber war. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody in here left. So we want to thank you again. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome anytime. No, we might call on you another time. How about next week? <laughs> <laughs> next week. <laughs> well, the thing yeah, we'll is, the whole situation changes by the day, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll talk sometime about the refugee uh, humanitarian crisis and spilling over into Poland with 2.1 million refugees there, and, um, and what that what that actually means uh, long term. But just that's another. Their limit, haven't they? I'm, yeah, I mean, this is they haven't really got much support from the Polish state, from the Polish government at all. At all. I mean, these, these are private citizens who have opened their homes. To to Ukrainian refugees and families, I I know several. In fact, almost everyone I speak to in Poland has somebody there. Uh, and but you know they they can't support them long term. Um, and uh, you know I have talked to one person who has nine nine refugees and so. So, I mean, it's, but the scale of it is unbelievable, but the response to the Polish state has been uh, meager. Uh, I don't 
remember they're expecting to pick up the pieces for them, maybe the European Union. Um, but they're not insulting the European Union. It's <laughs> but uh, but that, that's a that's a whole other story that we could get into at some other time. Yeah, I think that's another story for another day. Uh, yeah. So again, I would like to extend our appreciation, Bob. Oh, you're welcome. And Most hi, welcome. Hi to your family and all of them. I will. I thought you were retired now, are you? Kind of. Um, so I've got uh, five weeks to go. Wow. Ah. Well. So, uh, yeah, I've been giving lots of talks about Ukraine. Well, you're gonna you're gonna have to look for something to do once you retire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I've got I've got lots to do. <laughs> okay. Take care. Okay. We'll see you. Bye.